Before the break, we were discussing how St. Paul said about this contrast between life according to the spirit and life according to the flesh, that we needed to put to death the things of the flesh so that we will live. St. Paul was very clear in that letter that the sins of the flesh, living according to the flesh, is mortal. He tells us we will die. That's what's ultimately meant by a mortal sin. When we use our freedom rather than to love, to take advantage of somebody else for our own benefit. That brings us to the essential point that Christ uses throughout the Sermon on the Mount, which is the point of human freedom. God created us free, free ultimately so that we could love. No one can ever be forced to love. You can't go up to somebody with a gun next to the head and say, do you love me? Even if they were to say yes, it wouldn't be true. That love is an authentic response. And in order to be able to respond in love, man needed to be free to do it. But in freedom, man also has the capacity not to love, to lust, to take advantage, to use somebody else. And that choice, when man makes it, leads to death in this life and in the next. The choice is ours. Jesus knows that it's a hard choice for us to make. But what's very important is that Jesus, through his redemption, has made it possible for man to choose well. And he has sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we might choose well. The greatest action that we can do as a Christian is to say fully yes to the action of the Holy Spirit, much like Mary did in Nazareth when the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and Christ's own flesh took her flesh. So in our saying yes to the Holy Spirit, Christ's redeemed body, Christ's redeemed flesh will become our own too gradually over time. Pope John Paul II, in focusing on St. Paul's letter, basically piggybacks on the one who was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write to the Gentiles caught under the concupiscence of the flesh 2,000 years ago about how practically to overcome it. St. Paul, in his letter, first letter to the Thessalonians, gets even more specific about how that is to be done. In the fourth chapter, he says, This is the will of God, your sanctification that you abstain from unchastity, that each of you knows how to control his body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like heathens who do not know God. St. Paul says very clearly that God's will for us is holiness. He wants us to be a saint. But in order for that to come about, the first thing we need to do, he tells us, is to abstain from all unchastity, to kick out, to evict lust from our hearts. And then the second thing is to hold our body in holiness and honor. Holiness is not just a thing about our wishes and about our spirit and our soul. Holiness is also supposed to be something that thoroughly invades our entire personality shown through the body. So we need to hold that body in holiness. We need to hold it in honor. Pope John Paul II explores what St. Paul means by this holiness and honor on the basis of another letter St. Paul wrote, this to the Corinthians, who out of all the communities to which St. Paul would write, was probably the one caught most under the concupiscence of the flesh, the most licentious community in all of Greece. St. Paul talks in that letter about the mystical body of Christ, which is the church. And he uses an analogy from human experience about holding certain parts of the body in greater honor. Pope John Paul II says that he's using a sexual analogy to describe the church, but insofar as what St. Paul wrote about that sexual analogy in the human body, we can learn much more about what he means about holding our body in honor. And the 12th chapter, that first letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul writes, but as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, what would the body be? Where would it be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor again to the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. 
What St. Paul is saying by way of analogy with the church is that by modesty, we hold our inferior members, our sexual parts, in greater honor, that we cover them up, that we treat them with greater respect. That's the type of shame that it has a good aspect to it. In the lust that has invaded man's heart, there was a twofold shame. First, they were ashamed of each other. They were ashamed that they were lusting after each other and that the other was lusting after him. And as a consequence, to prevent that type of sexual utilitarianism, Adam and Eve covered their sexual parts, lest they be an object of appropriation for the other. But there was also a positive side to shame, which called man back to how God had originally made him, to that nuptial meaning of the body, and they were protecting the nuptial meaning of the body by their covering up those inferior members. St. Paul says that one of the practical consequences of treating the body in holiness and honor is to be modest with those sexual parts so that someone else cannot do them dishonor and so that one person cannot do them dishonor in his own body by exposing them for the intentional gratification of other people. That is precisely what happens in pornography. That's precisely what happens in all types of sort of sexual exhibitionism, which can happen even when people wear clothes. In each of these two last passages of St. Paul, St. Paul reveals that the Christian virtue of purity is the effective way to become detached from the lust of the flesh in the human heart. According to Paul, purity is a capacity centered on the dignity of the person in relation to the femininity or masculinity of the other person's body. Purity is a virtue. Purity is a set of choices, a habit in the human heart that allows man and woman to treat their own body and to treat the other person's body in holiness and honor. Without doing so, man and woman can never become the saints that God calls them to be. Listen to what St. Paul wrote. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them the members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said the two shall become one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Therefore shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a great price. Therefore glorify God in your body. St. Paul describes two things. First, when we make love, when we become united in the flesh with somebody else, that's meant to supposed to be a covenantal expression of the communion of persons. And when we do that with a prostitute, he says, we become one body with that prostitute. Think about what that means. With the use of the second part of that teaching of St. Paul, the body is meant to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. And any time we live according to the flesh, while our body is supposed to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, it would be like desecrating a church, desecrating a tabernacle where God lives. None of us would ever think about committing a sacrilege like that if we're faithful. But that's precisely what we do when we live according to the flesh. Christ and St. Paul and Pope John Paul II and I call us away from that. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit because Christ redeemed the body and made his body the tabernacle of God in the flesh. In order for us, therefore, to live according to the Spirit, Pope John Paul II says there needs to be piety associated with this purity of heart. Piety is the virtue that helps us to treat the things of God as they deserve to be treated. And our body is not our own. It's meant to be treated as we treat God. What an incredible mystery and what an incredible truth and summons that is. Purity is the glory of the human body before God. It's the positive good opened up by the overcoming of desire. That is what life in the spirit ultimately means. Christ's teaching on the human body is a pedagogy. It's a series of truths on the base of which Pope John Paul II's theology of the body is made. And in Christ, in calling us to live according to the Spirit, to shun immorality, to hold our body in holiness and honor, to glorify God in our body, to never look on a woman with lust in our hearts, is calling us to be the saints he created us to be from the beginning. 